thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, everybody from Light, um, our friends, our family, our guests. Um, today we're doing a virtual one woman show, which is a new experience for me, um, with a very good friend of mine and an artist whose work I very much <laughs> admire, um, Amanda Scoglia. And uh, we're gonna have a little tour of Amanda's studio. Um, we're gonna show some of her work. We're gonna talk to her about some pieces learn a little bit about uh, her process and her routine. And uh, also let everybody know that if anybody has questions, you can feel free to direct message me through Zoom. Um, and I'll make sure that um, I, I ask as many of them as possible. Um, I assume none of them will be for me, so I won't answer them, I'll just ask them. Um, but the, the motivation for this, um, if it's not self-evident, is that you know at light we talk a lot about um, all the things that um, we aren't able to do in terms of mainly concerts, um, also sporting events, but those those are the kinds of things that we work with professionally, um, clubs, theaters, festivals, um, arenas, and you know we've lost the ability to go do all that stuff, um, but. A lot of us are also involved in different ways, either on the creative side or just as patrons. Um, of the arts as well. And so we're all very much missing things like Art Walk and First Thursdays and going to galleries and openings and, um, you know, starting to really feel the effect of that as well. And so this is just an attempt to see if we can, um, you know, if we could bring some of that um, to the virtual world the same way we've seen performing artists bring their stuff to people as well over Zoom. So. Um, I think you and I, Amanda, have figured out a way to make this work. Um, I'm going to chalk it up. I'm going to call it all a big experiment, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to put together something good. So um, with that preamble, uh, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is I'm going to read from a little bit of a script that I have here because uh, I want to introduce you and I want to introduce you properly and correctly. And I want to make sure I don't get any facts wrong. So I'm going to paraphrase some stuff from your website. Okay. Start. I hope that I updated my website in the parts that you looked in. And if any of it's factually incorrect, um, that's, that's your fault. So, um, <laughs> so Amanda uses traditional mediums of oil painting and printmaking to examine our intuitive and spiritual relationship to nature. Drawing from life and painting en plein air are in integral parts of her practice. Amanda received her MFA in 2013 from the New York Academy of Art, where she studied anatomy and figurative art and was given the David Kratz and Gregory Unis Scholarship of Merit. She's been awarded a number of artist residencies, which I will not spell out because I don't want to embarrass myself with the pronunciations. Let's just leave it at a number of residencies. She's also a 2018 recipient of the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation Grant. Amanda teaches figure drawing in public workshops and private lessons, has been interviewed by Sotheby's for their blog, and has had her work featured in many shows, fairs, publications, and exhibitions. Amanda's also been part of some very creative, some very interesting creative projects, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, so I won't read those off here. And Amanda and I met when we both lived in New York City. Um, I own several of her works, which hang proudly and dominantly in my home and which I'm going to share later on. Um, so Amanda Scalia, welcome to Light. Thank you for making time to visit with us from your secure bunker art studio somewhere in Pittsburgh. <laughs> welcome. Thank and you. A little bit more before we get started, um, I want to let everybody know that there's a piece for sale right now on your website that um, I personally love, um, and it's available as part of a World Wildlife Fund um, fundraiser related to the Australian wildfires, which unfortunately um, got lost in the news, I think, over the last month or two, um, but there's still a lot of sort of suffering going on there. I am going to take a second and post a link into the... Um, into the Zoom chat um, <clears throat> to that page. And I just want everybody to know that they either have to buy that piece by the end of this <laughs> conversation or I'm buying it. So 
you can either defer to me and my wishes and let me have it, or you can steal it out from under me. But either way, that painting will be gone um, within the hour. Um, so <laughs> with that said, um, how are you? I'm great. That was a really good introduction. You definitely did your homework. I forgot some of those facts. Um, <laughs> So, and thank you also for finding that piece on my website. The story with that is, yes, it did get lost in the news um, because of everything else that happened, but also uh, that was part of a uh, Colossal, which is this big company that was doing, kind of encouraging artists to create work and donate um, to the Australian wildfires. What happened was I did the painting, I put it up on the website, and then either that day or the next day, I went into the ER to get my appendix removed, mm -hmm. and I completely, like, had a three week recovery and didn't go, come back to that. And then everything else happened. So <laughs> thank you for going back to that. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so have you been working creatively during the lockdown? Yes, um, I found it, uh, well, first this is, so we are in my real actual studio that I normally paint in. And then of course, with everything else it got closed down. And so what I did was I just grabbed all of my paints and some paintings that were in progress. And I took them home into my apartment. And so I built a little corner in my apartment and kind of like proofed the wall. I put plastic up and stuff on the ground so that it didn't get messed up. And I've been painting in that space. Um, and I found it a little bit difficult when things started to first happen to be, to jump right back into the creative ideas that I had before because I was so affected by what was going on. And so I found that it was helpful to not paint for myself, but to paint for, <clears throat> for um, uh, my friend who's on the phone actually, Nicholas Sanchez is a very, um, a great artist and, and one of my best friends. And he was doing this movement of let's paint and donate the money to to these causes and let's let's raise as much money as we can and so he used his platform which is much bigger than mine to um encourage other artists to to paint and so that's what i did i just painted things that um you know little little paintings on paper and i sold uh, i did up to three i did three of them and donated them to different charities um in regards to the covid raising money and so that's what i was that's what i've been doing for the last few weeks that's wonderful. Is your um, is your current routine um, in terms of work in term you know in terms of your creative work is it is it different? Has it been disrupted? Like what's a what's a normal work routine for you, and is it different now? So yes, um, all so normally uh, I try to go every week. It's more it's more been like every few weeks, um, but I I do like to go steadily to figure drawing live figure drawing with the model. And those, those sessions have been canceled. So, and because of that drawing from life, that aspect, the only people I can draw are the people that I'm quarantining with, which is just my boyfriend. And so there's, there's not, I can't go draw models, you know? And so there's, there's been a lot of changing. So just last week or just a few days ago, um, there were a group of friends that I used to draw with in New York who have now started to set up Zoom model sessions. So oh, these wow. models are, are just modeling over Zoom and it's a very interesting and very strange experience to draw somebody that's on a screen that's really small, but you're drawing them larger and you know that they're larger in real life. And, and it's, yeah, so it's, it's a little different. That's interesting. Have you, have you, um, have you painted outside at all? I, have I painted outside since we started? I haven't painted outside just because it's cold. It is still cold here, oh, okay. but um, it is the the weather is starting to turn, and I've already started to scout a, a, a few places that you know on a warm day I'll get out there and and paint. I think the last time I painted outside was what month is it? I, it was like last month. I went out to I went out to, to a picnic or, with my boyfriend, and we just like laid out and in, in tr under the tree, and I painted the trees and him and. Um, that was the last time I painted outside, but so that was, that was actually during COVID. Yeah. So I did paint outside once. Yeah. yeah. So, um, want to show us a little bit around the studio? Oh, sure. Yes. Awesome. So it might be a little shaky or awkward, but I'm trying to show, this is the entire space. Um, and then when you walk in, starting over here, I have my, some of my figure drawings here. I have everything kind of separated by medium. Um, and these are all charcoal. 
And then here's my work table where I have some prints, um, but this is where I mix paint. It's all a mess right now. Do you ever do open studio stuff? Do people come in there? Yes, we do open studios. I'm a part of a collective, so there's a lot of artists in here, and we do open studios twice a year. So once in the fall, once in the spring. So I'm sure we're not gonna do that, maybe. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, we're open to the public and they all come in and people buy work. And the last time I did an open studio, I did for the first time live drawing. So I did, I had people just walk in and if they wanted their portrait drawn for 10 minutes, I did their portrait. And it was like 20 bucks or something for 10 minute, for a 10 minute portrait. Right. Cool. Um, here are some monotypes, which I think you remember that show. I think you went to that show. I have one. You have? You do. Oh, you do have one. You have that one. I'm going to show it. <laughs> the better version of that one. That's the, that's the bad version. And then, so over here, we have some plein air paintings that I've done in the past that I just keep in this little corner to look at for color reference. And it, can everyone see, is it clear? Is it like crisp and not pixelated? Yeah, it's, it's very clear. Um, the one thing okay. I would say, just so everybody knows, if you can't see the art itself that well right now, don't worry because um, we're gonna look at some slides a little bit later and you'll get to see some pictures. Um, you'll get to see some of the art in, in larger format and much more just much clearer. And but I don't yeah, know if, if you guys are used to Zoom, but if you like hit pin video, like right click on my square and hit pin video, mine will stay large so that you can see the large, like instead of looking at, at a smaller screen. Oh yeah, why am I not doing that? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. Great, thank you. Um, so this is the last, um, my most recent body of work that I had, a, I think the last show I had was, I had a solo show in Pittsburgh in August. And so these are some pieces from that show. Yeah, these are beautiful. Thank you this and so they're we're not working off of any assumption what's the medium here oh sorry uh these are all oil paintings mm -hmm. and um some of them are on panel and some of them are on canvas oh and there's some up here too I forgot about these guys and that's the painting that you were talking about so you can kind of see for reference how small it is i mean that's the one i'm gonna own soon Yes. <laughs> and then over here, I have the new work, the most recent work that I've been, <clears throat> these, a lot of these are not done. I think the only one that's done is this one. Um, and so these are the newer work. So you get a little sneak peek before they're done. Excellent. And then we have a little portrait right here. Who's that handsome devil? That's my boyfriend. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> And um, what, where did you start? Was it, was it drawing? In life or, I mean. Yeah, you know, what was your way in? How did you, how did you come to art? Um, it's funny, I just, when I was very, very little, I mean, my, fa my father was a uh, aspiring photographer. So he took pictures of like every moment, waking moment of our lives. And so just very, very young, that's just what I was drawn to. I have my, you know, my parents kept everything that I made when I was a kid, but that's just what I really, you know, kids ask for things for Christmas toys. And I always asked for like a new kind of set of markers or paints or sand art or spin art. And so it was kind of the only thing that I really felt good at my whole life. And then I took it seriously. I started to take it seriously in high school and then when I went to undergrad, it was just like, there is, there was nothing else for me. It was just, that's just the only, it, it's just the way that I see the world and the way that I, I need to do it in order to exist, kind of. <laughs> so um, then after I graduated undergrad, I kind of took a long time to go to, to, to grad school. I, I traveled a lot. I kind of like did soul searching. I moved to New York City. Uh, I got my own studio didn't know what I was doing. I just started pushing the paint around because I did study art, but I was a graphic design major in college. So I only really took like introductory class, introductory classes. And then when I started experimenting in my studio, 
I think it was like, I think it took six years before I applied to grad school. Um, so I went to grad, I graduated from Edinburgh University in 2005 and I didn't go to grad school to, until 2011. What was in your um, portfolio for grad school? Your application? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it was a lot of drawings, bad drawings. Now that I know how to draw, right? Now that I know I'm technically trained how to draw, but there were there was a lot of drawings, uh, charcoal drawings of figures, and a lot of landscape paintings. So pretty much the same thing that I'm doing now. But um, I didn't have, you know, I wanted it, and I was I had the drive to do it, but it it was like there was just that missing link of understanding the history and why I wanted to, what these paintings mean, and also the technical training is absolutely that the school that I went to is the best school for technical training, hands down. So, um, yeah. So when I met you and, and first started to um, see your work, you were in a pretty heavy printmaking and doing the, um, the monotypes, I believe. Yes. Uh, and that was, so my perception was that was the medium you worked in. Um, and and then, I, then I came to see that you drew and that you painted. But how did you how did you come into printmaking and working in type? So when I went to Edinburgh, was it Edinburgh that I started? Yes, um, I took an introductory to printmaking class, and printmaking printmakers are very process oriented people. There's a lot of chemist like chemicals involved. You have to treat the metal this way with this chemical, and then you got to burn it with this one and and those things were really interesting to me, but I'm a sloppy, I'm just a sloppy artist. I can't, I can't keep up with the rules. I don't like rules. And so um, the teacher was like, okay, you clearly can't handle the structure. Why don't you try monotype? Because a monotype is basically a painting, but it's a print. And that just blew my mind. I mean, I did a lot of, I, I still have some, some, technical regular prints from my college years but when I learned a monotype I was like oh this is basically a painting but I could call it a print and it's a one-off and it's paper and it was just a really interesting technique and then when I got to grad school the printmaking shop there the, the teachers there were really so it's not a major at the school that I was offered so it was more an extra kind of this fun thing you could do to to um, add to your practice, to add to your work. And it gives you, it's a completely different process of um, making because you essentially, the process is you would take a piece of plexiglass or metal and cover it with ink. And then you remove it, you remove the ink with, let's say a towel or a t-shirt or something. And what you're removing, it's a reductive process. So you're removing what would be the white of the paper. And so, here, I'll just show you here. And so that plate, those plates were initially covered all, with all black, and then I removed the parts that, that remain white. And that's not really how painting is. Painting is more additive. You put paint on, on the canvas. Um, and so it's just a different, ex, it's just a, like a different muscle in your brain. Um, and it opens up a lot of possibilities and ideas. Like I can go into the print shop and have like a really bad art day, right? I can't do anything right. I can't think of anything. The paintings suck. But I can go in the print shop and make something completely new that unexpected and it just changes everything. That's interesting. Do you still, do you still um, go to the print shop or have you left that behind? Or <laughs> So there's, there is a print shop in Pittsburgh. It's very small compared to the one that was in New York. So I was in New York for, for 10, 12 years. And that print shop is massive and I was able to go all the time. And the one in Pittsburgh is much smaller and the, the hours are much more limited. And so in order to get in there, you know, it's, it's like maybe one day a week I could get in there and it's one tiny press with like maybe five people. And so the, just the, just the accessibility is a little bit less in this area so that's why i haven't gone in as often but then i really now i really can't go right because it's closed yeah. so um but it's not i haven't deserted it no. okay it's it's <laughs> interesting for me because when i look at the prints um you know you just described the process and you described it very well 
And I still can't get my head around the fact that when I'm standing in front of one of them, um, I get the painting additive piece. I don't get the reductive piece. Like it, it blows my mind that there's, it's, it's like, uh, it's almost like a sculpture. Like the, there were things taken away and then all of a sudden this thing appeared there. Um, it's really amazing to me. And the, and the level of detail and the, even the, um, you know, I, I would expect it to be much more um, sort of black and white and to get, to get subtlety and nuance in it. Um, it's really, it's, 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 I find it sort of hypnotic to look at. Um, it's amazing. I have a um, few magic tricks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the special <laughs> artist tricks. Um, let's look at a few pieces. Let's look at some. Let's look okay. at some I'm going to share my screen. This is the part where probably I melt down the internet. So hold on and bear with me for a second. <laughs> let's see. And if I did this right, can you see it? Yes. And it's big too. Nice. So um, what do we have here? What, if, you know, if you don't mind, if any of them are titled, if you want to start by telling us maybe the titles and the dimensions and just a, a thing or two about each piece. So this one I have here. And it is called, so I'll just show you for scale how big it is. This is for scale how big it is. It is 20 by 20. And this title of this one is Exposed. And uh, the process was, did you, what did you ask me? The process, is that what you said? Or what yeah, is it? Talk a little bit about, yeah, the process or the inspiration or where it was created, anything you Okay. So um, this was one of the, one of the B, I think it was one of the ones in the beginning when I started this process of, um, painting an entire painting on an already existing painting and then removing some of it. And so there was an entire painting underneath. There was just a painting that I finished and I set it aside for a year, two years or whatever it was um, because it wasn't ready yet. There wasn't, there wasn't a finished quality to it or, or it wasn't a complete sentence, <clears throat> right? And then I would take it and paint a whole nother painting on top of it. But before I did that, I put something in between those two layers in order to remove some of that second painting to expose the painting underneath. And so I really wanted to have two places that were existing at one time in the same place. And then what happens with that? That was kind of the idea. It was like, well, what happens if I put this place and this place at the same time? And it was my thought process behind doing that was when you're standing in a place, when you're experiencing, it's a, maybe it's a landscape or just an experience with a person or you can't, and you're not fully present, you're, it makes you think of something else. It reminds you of something from your childhood. You're thinking about your relationship. You're thinking about what's happening to this landscape in 30 years because of you know, global warming, anything, you're not fully experiencing just that, you're experiencing all these other things that are interjecting and what does that create? Is that a new, is that a new experience or is it two conflicting experiences? You know, this, it's kind of how I think about the world is in a paradox kind of push and pull way. There is an area that I'm aiming for. There's like just enough of this and just enough of that together. And when you put this aside, did you know what you were going to do with it? Was the intention to paint over it? Or did you just think I'll, I'll revisit it at some point and do something? Not when I first painted the first painting, I didn't know what would happen um, because it, it had been like a year at least. So sometimes I'll paint something and I don't want to throw it away because there is something there, but it just doesn't, it doesn't, I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what it's telling me yet. And so I'll hold on to some stuff. I do, I do throw some things away, but um, I didn't know what that was until later on when I was trying this process out. So. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. This piece just is stunning. Oh, thank you. What are we looking uh, at? This one is called Three Places at Once. And it's again, that, that same feeling of, um, of you're in a place and you're supposed to be present, but you're, you have this, uh, you know, your mother's bitching at you about this thing that you haven't done. And 
you're worried about, you know, am I too old? I'm never going to get married. And that's kind of what this was, you know, this was about, there was a friend's wedding is some of the reference photos that I took from to, for this painting was from a friend's wedding. And then the other reference was from a friend who was married and was having marital issues. And so I was kind of having these three thoughts and my, my process or my, my thought process with, with this was those three places are indicated by the color. So we have the light pink and then we have like the black and white and then the green weird blues. So those three different um, instances are, are identified by the color in this piece. And what, uh, just for sense of scale, what are the dimensions of this? This one is 30 by 40 and it is right there. So you can kind of see for scale. Yeah. Have you, um, have, have these exhibited anywhere? This one was in my solo show in Pittsburgh in August. And I think that's the only place that I've exhibited that one. Oh, and I forgot about this big one too. I don't know if I sent you this picture, but you've seen that one too. Yeah, I love that one. That was in the, uh, that was in the- uh, The show that you- Line, was it? The show that you um, interviewed. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. That was a great show. I love this piece. Um, <laughs> tell me about this. So this one is titled, uh, I Learned There's Beauty I Can't Keep. And it's a lyric from a song. But I thought that this, that particular lyric was very apt for the thing that I was getting at. Uh, I just sold this piece, actually. I just shipped it yesterday. And um, it's quite large. It's 40 by 44 inches. Uh, so this one was made after my time in Iceland. So I was in Iceland for a job, for an art job. And it was a very demanding job. It was a lot of hours that were not it was just a lot of hours of working and so we ended up staying in this hotel that was in the middle of nowhere and like I don't know if you've been to Iceland but it looks like Mars it looks like not otherworldly it's crazy and there's just this hotel in the middle of nothing and so you're looking out your window and it just it goes on forever and I just remember this one moment that we got of not working you know we got up at like three o'clock in the morning to start working and it's just this one moment of a breath that we got to come up for air. And I was, the landscape almost is, it, you have like, um, it's not, halluc not hallucinations, but it is very distorting to your, like, your yeah. perspective and your size or something. And, but it's also so mesmerizing that you, you want to like stare at it forever so that it burns into your brain and you never forget it. And these orbs that I put in this painting were kind of my way, my mark making of me wanting to re literally reach out and, and hold it or um, try to grab it and it's not real, you know? And that was kind of the thought behind, behind that one. Yeah, we're gonna talk about Iceland in a few minutes. So we'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. What do we have here? You made a little collage. Like a I'm creative too. <laughs> um, okay, so these are uh, the one on the left uh, is called Seasons Change. And it was, oh God, okay. Are these explanations boring? Are you sure you want me to explain? Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I don't care. <laughs> Everybody else is on mute, so I don't care what they think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the one on the left. It's called Seasons Change, and basically, uh, my thank you, Caitlin. Uh, basically, when I was a kid, so my father is an exterminator, and when I was a kid, I was really interested in um, moths and butterflies, and because I don't know if it had to do with him being an exterminator, but he would bring them home sometimes, like, oh, look at this one that I found, or this one that I had to, you know, whatever, and. I collected them as a kid. So I had a large collection of moths and butterflies in my room. And I have books, exterminator books from my dad on moths and butterflies. And I was really into the uh, symmetry of them, but also like 
symmetry bothers me in some ways. And so I was doing a lot of paintings of butterflies, not butterflies, I guess, but just um, symmetry marks that could look, you know, like Rorschach paintings, right? Yeah. So there was a lot of that happening in my studio and um, a lot of them are bad and you'll never see them. But this one turned out great, I think. I mean, it really got to what I was getting at with um, basically when seasons change, right? You have this new kind of, this new feeling of like, I'm gonna start over. Things are gonna, I'm gonna get my hair done. And I usually, these paintings are a lot about relationships with people, with friends, with lovers, whatever. And so this one was very, I wanted it to feel very hot summery, like the hot summer. And just before that happens, right? You know, as that's happening, it's about to cool down and what that might mean with in how that makes you feel in your, in your psyche, how that makes you feel in relationships. And so that's what that one is. That's not boring. The middle one is another Iceland painting. <laughs> oh, okay. From and that, that right, it's brand new. Did you um? So talk about that though. So did did you work from reference photos for that? For which for which one? For the center uh, piece. Yes. So the center piece one is photos that I took on top of a glacier that I hiked. Um, it was like four o'clock in the morning. And it was, again, there was a very disorienting feeling of like, not, not completely off balance, but it was just very, you know, and it's supposed to be like the cleanest air that you're breathing up there or something. And it was just so, it's like nothing you've ever seen. It's so beautiful, but at the same time, you're kind of dizzy and you know, the glaciers are melting and you have, it's just this very conflicted feeling um, and it's, it's just a little baby painting that, that that one is, but, uh, that's one of my personal favorite ones. I was thinking about not selling it. <laughs> and what, what's the last one on this, uh, this slide? Last one is brand new. Um, it's back here in the middle. Uh, so I, at the beginning of COVID, uh, lockdown, I had a friend reach out and say, right before it started, she wants me to, she's a collector of mine also, but she wanted me to paint her woods that she lives on, that she just bought, is building this house on in New York. And I said, great, let's plan a trip. I'll come to your house. I will paint out in your woods and then we'll decide on what size or what, you know, what kind of painting you want of your woods. And she was like, oh, here's a bunch of photos like, does any of this speak to you? And one of them was, but it wasn't her backyard. It was uh, a place that she had hiked. And she said, you know, I love these type of images. This is the kind of image that I want you to paint. And I was like, okay, can I just paint this for me though? Like, <laughs> I'm going to paint your woods, but I need to paint this image that you just sent me. You know, I'm not going to be able to go out. It's cold outside. COVID's happening. Can I just paint this? Um, and she said, yeah, and it's it basically, the image that she sent is, is very, you know, it's like a forest. It looks similar to the painting, but what I was trying to do was get into a mindset of balancing abstract and, rea and reality, like, like a representation of a, of a forest, but my, in my language, my abstract language, which is mark making, is more of a spiritual experience of a landscape than what it actually looks like. Like those aren't what really leaves look like. They're just paint splooches that kind of represent leaves, if that makes sense. Say that again, mark making. What do you mean by that? So my uh, particular way of painting, mark making is really important too. So the way that I put the brush to the canvas, the way that that mark looks, um, there's a word for it in art making. It's called economy of a brush. Like you want to make it for me, painters have different techniques, right? Or things that they want. But for me, I need to paint it in a way that looks like it was that it, it's, that it's not too fussed over. It's almost like it just happened instead of me fussing and rendering it. It needs to be a little bit more effortless and, uh, I guess just, it's my hand in there. You know, I want you to be able to tell, tell that my hand made that mark. It's kind of like a signature. I don't know. 
Okay, that's that's fascinating. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the question, but there's a great question here. So, how do you make yourself sell things when you love them? <laughs> yeah, I, let me add an Let me add to that question. Um, like, is there a line you can't cross where you 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 create something and you say, "No, that one's that one's staying with Mama." Um. So, you know, over, you know, just speaking with other artists and learning from artists and going to school and, and meeting artists, there's just been a, the general conversation, like, it's just like kind of a thing that comes up every once in a while that maybe once, maybe one thing from every large series of work that you make, you might want to keep for yourself. Maybe people treat it as an investment to say, like, maybe these these paintings might be valuable someday, but for me, it's more like a part of me. These paintings are a part of me, they're my babies. And so I wanna keep one of them for each large like growth spurt that I have or- um, Each litter? <laughs> yeah, with, the, with, each, with each litter, yeah. But I don't always keep them. I guess I think, you know, the ones that I want to keep are very often the ones that no one wants to buy anyway. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. So it works out for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think Jerry Saltz, like who's this like famous um, art critic, says like he always says like that one piece that you think like if you ever ask an artist what their best piece is, it's the piece that you think is the worst. You know. <laughs> that's funny. Um, Okay, we, I think we saw these on the wall, right? Let's, can you talk about these a little bit? Yes, so that's funny that you paired these two together. So both of them are titled Predator. One is Predator 2 and one is Predator 3. And the, the title comes from the movie, from the 80s movie. Um, and so visually, when I saw that movie as a child, the fact that a human is being seen visually by a heat map was very interesting to me and it stuck with me and uh, and i always think about that and i think that i've made multiples of these of this painting because i can't get enough of it i'm not even getting it right i, I there's so much more to make with that but um yeah just the thought of the I, it's really a play on words right because these paintings were more of a statement about who's the real predator is it the human you know or towards nature and so this was part of that series doing the Rorschach kind of um symmetry in my paintings and and also the the removing process of painting one whole painting on top of another one and and then removing some of it to expose what's underneath um while combining that thermal sort of uh heat map of a human in nature from the Predator movie. <laughs> and, and again, what's the scale of these? Oh, um, the one on the left is another 20 by 20. That's my most, most common size or most popular size. So you can see that. And then this one is, ooh, I have to measure this one. This one's an odd size. I wanna say 36 by 40, 36 by 42, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, um, when you said most popular size, do you just mean about um, for you that you paint with, or is that a commercial distinction? Both. I, I, that's my comfort, that's like one of my, I'd say if I had a comfort zone as far as sizes, I love painting that size. I don't know if it's the size of paintbrush ratio scale to the size of the canvas but it's just really it just really works out for me I think maybe my because sometimes I use my finger to remove paint and I think it's just a good size for my hands but um, I do paint a lot of large paintings too but that that is my most popularly sold size also I would say probably when you uh, when you first showed the uh, the painting on top of a, another painting a few slides back you said that there's a, a layer that you put over the original painting before you paint on again? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. What's the layer? Is it a substance, a chemical? Like what, can you talk about, can you just walk us through like, what do you do? That's the secret. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So it's, um, it's basically, you can do it many different ways. One way, for example, would be to use a lot of painters who use geometric shape and straight lines would use tape, right? So they would put a piece of tape down, paint a color next to it, and then pull the tape back so that they have that crisp uh, edge. And so I just use a form of masking that gives me an, an organic shape. Okay, so it's not a chemical. It's not a chemical. Gotcha, okay. Oh, this is a great, um, this is a great question. Have you ever painted on top of someone else's painting? Ooh, that is a good question. Have I? I don't know. Um, I have collaborated with friend, friends that are artists before, but I don't know that I've done that, but that would be a fun experiment. That would be a really cool collaboration experiment project. What form does a collaboration for you take? Do you work off the same canvas? I collaborated with two artists that are on this call and I cannot remember what we collaborated. Oh, it was, um, so, so one collaboration I did with two people that are actually on the call. There was, I forget what the project was, but I think it was just a, like a call for work from artists that were collaborating. And it was an installation piece. It had to be an installation piece, which is a completely different kind of artwork than I make. And so what we did was we had this, it was a site specific installation. So it was an abandoned building in New York. The area that we chose was this very um, church looking area of this building. Um, almost like people would pray in this little, um, I don't know what you call it. It's like a round cut out of a wall. And so what we did was, and there are three artists who were, were all really good friends, but our work all looks different. So what we did was we came up with the idea of like a stained glass window. And we, I had one, Nico Sanchez had another, and Megan Ewart who um, had another piece. And all three of us made our own work on three pieces of mylar and then hung them all together gotcha. to create kind of like, and so that's like an example of a collaboration that I've done. Gotcha. Um, Caitlin had a question. I'm gonna ask her to unmute herself because I don't want to uh, pronounce the artist's last name wrong. She wanted to ask you about an artist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, unfortunately I am uncertain on how to pronounce his last name, but he had a installation recently at the SF MoMA um, a few months ago and he used a lot of heat detection camera work. So I just found- A lot of heat, a lot of heat what? Heat detecting yeah. camera work. Heat detecting camera work, that's fascinating. I have no, not heard of that show, but I will look that up. Thank you for- The artist's last name is M-O-S-S-E. So it's either Moss or Mossy or Mosse. Mm-mm, I don't know it. Okay. Sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but I, I'll look it up. I love learning new artists. Whoops, let's go back one. So you showed these on the wall. Yes. Um, talk about this again, what, what were, uh, were these done off? Well, it looks clearly one of them was done in plein air. Uh, were the others off reference photos or also outside? So the one in the top left is uh, actually the only one that on there that's not water-based paint. That's an oil painting on paper. And that's one of the ones that I just did <clears throat> this week this like last week for um, one of the COVID uh, charities. So that one is from a photo. The one in the bottom left I did from life. The ones that are in a pile, the one in the middle, those are, that's from life. The one in the top right is from life. The one in the top, I'm sorry, the right bottom, the blue tree is from a combination of a photo and memory. So I painted that when I came home from uh, the Sequoia National Park in California. So. Um, Could you just go around the circle again, or around the loop again and, and where, say where each one is, if you remember? Yes. Top left <clears throat> is uh, from a s sunrise hike in, um, oh, I'm not gonna remember, Mount, um, it's whenever the eclipse happened, I hiked up this uh, Grand Teton. That's where it's from. Bottom left is 
San Diego. That's the, um, that point where all the seals are. I don't remember what that's called, Okay. but it's in San Diego. The middle one is Thailand. The top right is Erie, Pennsylvania at one of my, at my best friend's woods. And the bottom right is Sequoia National Park in California. The one in the woods. John Muir Woods. Sorry, John Muir Woods. <laughs> is that where some of the other pieces are that were in the show in New York, the larger pieces when you went out into the woods? Was that, is that the same landscape? Yes, same, same landscape, same people. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Good eye. <laughs> Told you I'm a fan. Um, <laughs> what do we have here? Um, these are some more recent figure drawings. So as a practice, right, as, as, as a person who's an athlete who goes to the gym, I draw for, to keep my muscles strong, my um, observation muscles and my drawing muscles. And so um, I was using a lot of paper for these drawings. A, a model gets up there, they, they pose for five minutes, they change a pose, you change your paper. And one day I was running low on paper and I was like, well, I'm just gonna draw the same on the same paper so over and over again. And it was apt, it was an apt move because there was a lot, you know, if you look at my older work, I don't think I have any in here, but like the, some older work from, from grad school, I did a lot of figure motion, figure is in motion, multiple figures. And so this was just a live way of doing that, of recording a person in motion in different stages. And I started to think about, well, that's kind of what I'm doing with paint, right? I'm having this experience on the first layer of painting and having another experience on the next painting that I put on top of it, um, but showing all of the stage, all of the process and all of the stages in between. And so, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing with the charcoal. It's really a great effect, isn't it? it it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's very special. Thank you. They look great on the screen too. Let's see what we have next. Ah, this is my little collection. <laughs> okay, we have to get you a better picture of the pink figure drawing in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, listen, you know, I just took that last night when I was setting this up. It was, it's actually very hard to, to shoot. It washes out very easily because the, um, I don't know if you remember, but it's actually a fairly light drawing. It is, yeah. And it's, it's against white, it's against a light wall. And if you turn a light on anywhere within like 500 feet of it, <laughs> <laughs> it completely washes out. It is a, it's a very difficult one to capture, but um, that was my first Amanda. And um, I love it so much. Um, although it makes my 15 year old uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> He's just pretending it makes him uncomfortable. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, talk through these, because I think each one of these has an interesting story. Okay, so the middle one is um, uh, a figure drawing like from one of my sessions and I think I had an open studio, right? And you kind of saw that I have hundreds of these drawings in a drawer and sometimes I just bring them, you know, a selection of them out. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. The top right is a monotype from the show of my monotypes where um, I went to Thailand and was looking at the roots that grow over structures there. So they kind of let these tree roots grow over the churches and they don't cut them they just let them these roots come out of the ground and they kind of like encapsulate the the structures there and so i did a whole series of work based on those based on that um and i was trying to make them figurative trying to pull figures out of these root like structures um and so that's from that show the one underneath it is called interlude Oh, I love that. And that painting was, that's the title of the show that it was in. And that was, I think, the only non-figurative piece. Non-figurative. There's not a figure in that piece. Um, but those two plants, um, to me, it was a portrait of, of kind of like a relationship between the two plants that could be figurative, you know, depending on how you look at it. But the idea behind that painting was, and the reason that it's called interlude, 
is that sometimes there's a moment in between other things, these big moments that we kind of like don't think are as important, or maybe we just treat it as an introduction to something else or the thing that comes before something or the thing that comes after something. But that in between is also really significant and means something. And so that's when I, when I was painting these paintings with the figures in the woods, that was a moment that happened right before the sun went down that didn't have figures in it. We weren't posing or anything, but that was still, it still meant something to the rest of the paintings. Uh, the top left is a book cover for Frankenstein. I was commissioned with another artist on the call, Jessica Ogier, to do prints of famous book covers. And I did a lot of them, but I think you really liked the Frankenstein one and asked me to do one for you privately. Like as it, it, this obviously wasn't their Frankenstein, but you were like, that's a cool thing. I want that. Well, and actually I have one of Jess's as well because uh, she gave me The Great Gatsby, which is one of my favorite books. Um, and uh, that's also hanging downstairs. Um, and it's similarly beautiful. And maybe everybody can see that when I have Jessica come talk. But um, Ooh, yeah, I, I really loved when you guys were working on that project. I thought it was so cool that um, that you were getting paid to do what you do. Like that to me was like, that's the, that's the very definition of success in my mind is that you were, you had this commercial project, but you were, if I remember correctly, and you can, you, you have to slap me in the head if I'm wrong, you were given kind of pretty like free reign to, um, like you were constrained yeah. in terms of like, it had to be sort of famous books, but you guys just kind of went to town and went into the print shop and and, and did your interpretations? I think there was a list. So it had to be, or there was a requirement, like it had to be a classic uh, novel. It had to have so many, it had to be certain popularity too. It couldn't be like an obscure thing. So I did like um, Dracula. I did uh, Robinson Crusoe, um, Little Women. So there was a lot, there was a, we did a lot. I think I did nine or something. And she did even more than probably double what I did. And the, oh, Peter Pan, she said, <laughs> Peter Pan, that's right. Um, <laughs> I can't believe she remembers this, it's a long time ago. So I think you saw this, because we didn't post them because they were a private commission for a hotel or somebody's house a or hotel something. hotel or an apartment building or something. Yeah, and so we weren't supposed to post them, but somehow you saw this, probably because we're friends, and you were like, hey, I want, <laughs> I want one. <laughs> and no, so you know, I think I knew about it. The two of you were complaining about how much work it was. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was. It was a lot of books. Um, and the, the last piece down in the lower left, I think people will find fascinating just because the size of it and, um, and what the materials are. Okay, so there was a show in New York, um, which was called, uh, um, what was it called? It's the name of the fair of the of the Metro card. One of the one of my one of my artists will probably write it in there. But it was a it was the show of Metro card paintings. So these Metro cards they run out, they expire, and then you what you just throw them away. Like there's no recycling for them. And so there was an artist by the name of John Pierre Roy, who was one of our professors, who came up with the idea of like, why don't we just prime these Metro cards and make paintings on them? And he started a show uh, and it grew. There was three, I think three iterations of that show. Single fair, thank you. <laughs> uh, he typed it privately, but it's called single fair. And it grew from like a group of maybe a hundred artists to like a few hundred artists. The last time that they did it, I think there was like 6,000 pieces or something crazy in the show. And they don't limit to how many you can put in. So you can put like 10 in if you want. And so it's, it's basically just a primed Metro card. And every, the cool thing about that show is that no matter who painted on that Metro card, whether they're famous, whether they're just a struggling artist, every single Metro card is $100. And so if you buy one, that money you know, it doesn't, it's not, so it, it completely is different from this, this like gallery, like, you want to invest in someone or, you know, this one's more expensive or this one's not as successful or whatever. It doesn't matter who you are. It was anonymous. And oh, so, for example, that's how I got one of my, 
one of a famous artist, but also one of my favorite painters, Megan Ewart, who's on the call, um, bought me as a surprise, bought an Alex Konevsky Metricard painting and gifted it to me, which I like cried because how in the world would I ever own an Alex Konevsky painting other than if he painted it on Metricard it was a hundred bucks. So it was just a really cool thing to be a part of in New York. Um, it was a really cool show. And that one was one that probably didn't sell. And I think you liked it. You expressed that you liked it. I put it online and I, I think I gifted it to you. Did I gift it to you? I should have gifted. Okay. Good. It's, <laughs> on my it's on my fireplace right now. Um, sort of across the room from interlude. Um, so there are some great questions that have stacked up. I'm going to, I'm going to answer them. And then I still have a couple of my own and then I know it's late where you are. So I don't want to um, tie you up too much longer, but some of these questions are too good to pass up. I'm going to start with the last one. Um, uh, can you see the questions or do you want me to read them to you? Oh, sorry. Um, I no, I can, I'm fine to read them to you. The okay. question from Ann has to do with um, the, the, the level of detail in interlude. Um, well, I'll just read it verbatim and then we can bat it around. He says, hard to figure out how to articulate this question. In interlude, I am struck by the detail of every individual leaf, as am I. Um, what was the process like focusing on each individual leaf on one little sapling? Painstaking. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, that's the moment, right? That's the moment that I was getting was that each leaf has a different color. It has a different temperature. It has a different direction that it's facing. And that was so interesting to me, um, kind of like limbs, of a human body, you know, there's like each one is so uh, interesting. And so um, that was probably one of the first non figurative pieces that I painted, but it was, it was more, it was diff more difficult than I thought it would be, but it, I mean, I love it. Yeah, I so. love it too. I love it too. Um, the great thing about that is you told the same story here that you told me in the gallery, because I would have been very angry if there had been a different st origin story <laughs> about the painting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nico asked a couple of great questions, but I'm going to come back to his. Um, uh, one of our friends, Shashank, asked, um, do you ever start a piece and then get the equivalent of writer's block? Um, and you kind of alluded to that with the um, with the paint over painting, although I don't think it was writer's block so much as you just you weren't satisfied with where it was at. So do you ever get the equivalent of writer's block? And if so, what are the different techniques you use to get over that? Or do you just start all, all over um, with the same concept? You just sort of call a do over. So the equivalent of writer's block would be artist block, right? And I have used that term before and, and it does happen occasionally. I've had, I've had it uh, memorable times, a few times um, where you're just in your studio and you don't like nothing, you don't, it's, it's weird. It's not like you, it's like you don't feel like doing it or you just don't know what you were doing. You, you kind of like lose what your purpose was. Um, or you try something and it sucks and you're like, I'm, I'm just the worst artist. I'm such a fraud. Like, what am I doing here? And the best way for me, everyone has their own process, I'm sure, is for just, I just need to leave. Because if I already am recognizing that, it's, that, that that's happening, I know it's not my day to paint because whatever I paint is not going to be good anyway. And so maybe I'll go outside and look at something I might want to paint at some point. I can, there's different ways of making art. There's, I mean, you can scout where you're gonna paint next. You can take photo references. You can read other artists' books or look at pictures, you know, that other artists have made and, and then get inspired that way. Um, sometimes when I have artist block, it's like for a particular medium. So like oil paint is not agreeing with me today. So I'm gonna go to the print shop. Print shop is the best, answer to artist block. <laughs> um, yeah, you alluded just, to that earlier. You alluded to that earlier that you could go yeah. in and there's sort of, I don't know, what is it? Is it that there's no failure or, or like, what's the, is it just I, that the stakes are lower for you? Like what, what's the? I don't know what it is if, there, if there's like a, because there's, you lose kind of a, a control, there's a little bit less control with it. So you kind of aren't, 
I don't, I think there's, it's kind of like even your, even a shitty print is still not ugly. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the print shop is very good for like, you know, painting sucks today. I'm going to go in the print shop up or, um, or just, okay, today's just, I'm just going to do something different, you know, and just yeah. wait for it to be a better, because sometimes it's like affected for me. It's like, if I didn't eat a good enough meal that day, or I'm, I'm like thinking about work or some other kind of distraction. And I just need to like, okay, well today's right now is not my best use of my time. I, I should just exercise and get that out of the way. And then when I come back, I'll be better suited to paint. There's a couple of, uh, leave it to Nico and Megan to ask some of the nerdy questions, but these are great. So, um, I'm, I'm excited to hear your answers to some of these. The first one, um, what tape do you use? <laughs> well, Nico, you can go to hell. <laughs> oh, is this an ongoing thing? He's trying to get your secrets? He is trying to get my secrets. Um, yeah, it's, an, it's, a, it's kind of an ongoing joke, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Um, smart ass. Tro <laughs> trolling my uh, interview. Um, <laughs> A couple of questions here that I think could be grouped in the same vein. So I'm going to, I'm going to read them together um, from Nico and Megan. Um, okay. Is there a piece that really centralizes all of your concepts? Is there one that really hits the nail on the head for you? Um, and then is there one that's your favorite painting and why? Uh, ooh, coming in with hard questions. Um, okay. So I think with each series, there are definitely paintings that really get it, that are kind of like, that's what I was going for. And that's a good, you know, it's a good outcome. I'm trying to think out of this grouping. Like I think the predator one, and it took me a long time, it took me like four, times to get it right like I've painted it a lot and painted on top of this one a lot and I think that that really when it happened I was like yes like that's what I was getting at and that's what I wanted to happen um even though I could still do the predator paintings like I feel like I could still keep keep doing them because there is there's like there's just so much in that for me um so I think with this series the predator painting does that um but like other series you know of course there's i mean there's not i didn't send you this painting but there was a painting that i did with the last series with all the figures of a bunch of women laying in the grass on top of each other in a pile I love and that. yeah and so that one for that series was really like oh okay like there was no sacrifice in because sometimes you do a painting and there's like, well, it's like 90% or 95% there. And that one, you know, like that was like a hundred percent. So. Do you mostly have the technique to achieve the things you visualize? Do I, what was the question? Sorry. You have the, the technique and the, the, the technical capability to execute the things you see in your mind's eye. Oh yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At this point you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the problem is that the technique for me, like my, perfection of technique is a effortlessness. And so there's a, there is a possibility of overwork. And when you do that, it's shit, right? So you have to get it. You gotta like, okay, I'm gonna put this brush on, on the thing and I better get it right the first time I put that mark down. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, um, it's a similar concept with, with musicians, the idea of too many notes or overplaying or, um, yeah. Um, so this, this question may have been answered, um, but also from Nico, what's the last uh, painting or, or piece of work that you've done or art making experience that helped you, uh, unexpectedly helped you reach another level in your work or how you view your work in a way that elevated it? I like that question. There's a little, it's a little- Can you I just said read them, it one more time again? Yeah, I'll read it verbatim. What okay. is the last painting, drawing, print, or art making experience that unexpectedly helped you reach another level in your work or how you view your work in a way that elevated it? So um, I would say 
so I, um, experimenting with the masking and the painting on top of paintings. Um, that was a newer, I've always kind of painted on top of other paintings and maybe like left a little bit. Um, but I kind of hid that. I didn't really like, I didn't really want you to know it that I was doing that. And this, with this last series, it's kind of like in your face. You kind of can tell like, oh, there's like a painting underneath that painting. And um, it looks like tape or something was blocking it. And so it's a little bit more owned and in your face and, and obvious. And I, I do credit that experimentation period to getting the grant. That grant was extremely helpful for me. Um, because there, of course, with money and, and stuff, there's, you don't want to waste materials. You don't want to waste a canvas. You want to like, there's like this nervousness of like, well, if I don't, you know, there's like a precious, you, you treat your materials preciously, but when you have kind of, okay, well, there's somebody who's giving me money to make artwork so I can experiment and I can, um, try new things. I think that that was really transformative for my work and for being braver in experimenting and not having to worry about saving materials or I don't know if that answers the question, but that's okay. It's your answer. <laughs> um, there's a couple of more in the chat and then I, I have a couple of quick other ones and I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that it's getting late for you. Um, uh, Arthi on our team asked, do you continue to paint in a medium or concept because that is what makes you happy or are you trying to get it right? and then you move on once you get it right. Get it right. Um, that's an interesting question. I paint things, I don't think because they make me happy, I think I paint things because I need to. So there's like, it's almost like an itch or like a pinging, it's like someone's tapping you and you're like, if you don't paint it, they're never going to stop tapping you. You know what I mean? And, um, and so once you paint it, then you're like, okay, the tapping is going to stop or it's going to open up a new thing. Like once you make another, once you make one painting that says something to you and you're like, Oh, I got to do this other thing now. And then I got to do this other thing. And, um, and so of course painting makes me happy, but I don't do it for like, Happiness is, is like kind of like a side effect. Yeah, that makes sense. I, 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 I can, I used to feel that way about playing music. So I understand that, that, <laughs> and that, 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 that happy curse. Um, Megan has a couple of other questions, which are all fun. Um, if you could collaborate with any artist living, I like that she, she qualified it that way. Um, yeah, it's good. It Who would it be? You baby. <laughs> uh um oh, not me okay living artists collaborate um god there's so many i mean the queen of queens cicely brown would be a dream um yeah i think cicely brown would be a dream or um yeah, I don't know. I have, I should collaborate more. I don't, I haven't really, you know, artists are weird. Like they kind of stay in their box, you know, and they just like are by themselves and stuff. And we should really like collaborate more. You know, it's funny you say that. I've talked to so many people lately in more of a business context who have said, oh yeah, you know, I, I work alone or I'm an independent business person or all these different people that self-identify as um, people who, um, are alone because of their trade who have all said, Oh, I really should be doing more with other people. And I think that um, there wasn't, you know, I, I, clearly it's born of everybody having to be isolated right now and either craving more or realizing that they actually did collaborate in even small, subtle ways back in the old days, six weeks ago than they do now. Yeah. Uh, but it's funny that you specifically said that because I could transplant that comment to so many different conversations. <laughs> um, all right, this one, I, I don't know if this is a joke question or not, but I, I, I can imagine it being a joke question and not being a joke question. How has Instagram influenced your studio? Influenced my studio? Um, 
I'm who assuming asked, means are you self-conscious about the way you present it? Like, do you, who Megan? Asked, okay. Um, how's my Instagram influences my studio, or the other way around? How does how, how does Instagram influence your studio? Do you think about how you present yourself? I don't think about Instagram when I'm in the studio. I think about Instagram. So basically, for me, my Instagram is a documentation. It's kind of like a journal entry, like a documentation of like what I'm doing or what I'm making. And so sometimes I put, I will say this, sometimes I've put paintings on Instagram that are not finished yet. And I say that, I say they're not finished yet because there is, there is something interesting about seeing something that's not finished yet and where it's going to go. I, th I think when I follow other artists, I'm like, Ooh, look at that. And then I see two weeks later, like what it turns into. It's interesting. Yeah, that's great. But I would say that sometimes it messes with your head when you put something that's not finished and people have something like that are like, don't touch it. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to touch it. I'm going to change it. But it's, but that, but you remember it when you touch it. And I wish I don't, I wish not to remember it. You have to turn off comments. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I'm going to combine uh, two questions, one from Megan and one from me. She said, what's your favorite studio wine? And I want to know if you listen to music while you work. Favorite studio wine is always red and it's always in a box. And, um, um, yes, I cannot paint without music. All of my, all of, of my mark making, all of, I mean, I'm constantly dancing when I'm painting. I was a dancer as a child. And so I learned that you take a sound, a piece of music, and you interpret that into a gesture, into a movement, and how that translates emotion. So I do the same thing when I paint. It's like I hear a sound, and I translate that into an image or a, a mark or, yeah, I have to listen to music. Yeah. Awesome. And is it always Beyonce? It is never Beyonce. I only listen to very specific music when I paint. And so um, it's, I don't allow other kind of music in my, I have a painting um, playlist and I'm in the future, I would love to, I've, already, I've tried it a few times to reach out to different musicians because there are certain, you know, James Blake is one of them where just, he is, if I could make my paintings sound like something, it would be his music and, um, and I think that it would be really interesting. There are artists like Bon Iver, Iver, whatever you say, however you say his name. He, he, I don't think he collaborates with this one painter, um, but he definitely always has the same artist make his cover art. And it, it's interesting because then you identify that painting as having that kind of Bon Iver sound. And so that's, I'm really interested in that and I would love to collaborate with a musician to see like, okay, well, you make these sounds, what do those sounds look like? What does it look like coming out of into paint? Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember going to shows at the kitchen in Manhattan in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and like Rammel Z would be spray painting or DJing, and there'd be a DJ and a spray painter, you know, teamed together um, with a big curtain canvas on the wall. And that would be the evening show, would be a DJ and a spray paint artist. Love um, that. Yeah, really cool stuff. Um, all right, I have two last questions for you. Um, if anybody else chimes in with questions, I'll, I'll make sure we get theirs done. But can you tell us a little bit about um, the Bjork project you worked on? <laughs> That's old. Um, Bjork project, yes. So when I, uh, when I was in New York as a youngin, I was like, you know, early 20s. Um, looking for jobs, whatever, on Craigslist at like two in the morning or something. I came across a Craigslist ad that said, looking for artists that can draw and paint from observation. Or, or like, you know, can, can take a picture and then draw it how it looks. So I was like, well, I could do that. And um, so I applied, you know, to this Craigslist post. I had no idea what it was for. And so I just sent them like really crappy drawings I did in college. And it was like four in the morning. And it, I would say like within an hour, they, they replied. <laughs> like, Why are these people up? You know what I mean? And they said, you know, 
come to this address tomorrow to see if you get the job. And then it said in the address, um, Matthew Barney's studio. And I almost peed my pants because Matthew Barney is a super famous artist. And I studied him in art history and I wrote a thesis paper on him. And I was like, there's no way. And so I get there and sure enough, it's Matthew Barney's massive warehouse studio. And it's a team of people from San Francisco. It's like a production company and they're there, they're staffed there to make a Bjork music video. And Bjork was married or whatever, partners with Matthew Barney of a child together. And so they were using his massive warehouse because he had the space and because they're married. So I got the job and then we created the entire, it was the Wanderlust music video. And everything in that music video is made from scratch, from hands, from an artist, except for the water. I think it's CG. Um, it was a 3D, very experimental process of um, a 3D music video. So if you wear those red and blue glasses um, and you get the right copy of that video, they built this production company, built this camera so that you could watch it in 3D. And uh, I got to meet Bjork and, and, and like, you know, hold her up so that she didn't fall. And uh, it was only two days. We only filmed with her for two days but it took three months to build the whole set. Um, I was a sculptor, I was a painter, did all the kinds of things. That's fucking amazing. <laughs> I forgot about that. I love That's that cool. story. I love that story. <laughs> um, all right, so we, we, we had some foreshadowing early on about Iceland and it yes. oddly enough was not about Bjork. Um, you seem to have an Icelandic thread through your work. <laughs> <laughs> you making connections <laughs> i'm smart like that um <laughs> tell us about the iceland project i was going to show the video but it's it's two or three minutes it's long, long right? yeah and we've we'll talked around it. Everyone, everyone's after. getting bored by now i'm um, gonna post it into the chat at the end okay so uh lou bolin is an artist a chinese artist who um who paints, he's, you know, he's known as the invisible man and he paints himself, his own body to match the background in which he's standing so that he looks like he's not there. And it's a really interesting process. Um, and he has a lot of like politically driven work and he's just a very, very cool guy, very great art. Um, but he needs people to paint him, right? Cause he can't do it himself. So it's, it's a lot of like performance. And then there's a photo take, there's a photo being taken of him doing it. And so it's like performance art, it's painting, it's photography. Um, so he needs assistance to paint him into his backgrounds. And those painters have to be observational painters, you know, not abstract painters or whatever. And so he worked with a gallery, Eli, Eli Klein Gallery in New York City. And one of the women who was there, uh, who was responsible for recruiting, um, basically put out a call to our grad school and said like, you know, if you want this job, like come on down. And um, we did a few projects with Lou Berlin prior to the Iceland one. And the Iceland one just happened to, they just happened to ask me. Um, and four of us painters went, and it was a secret. So she basically texted me and she said, do you have a passport? I said, yes. She said, can you, can you take off work for two weeks and travel internationally if I don't tell you where it is? <laughs> yep, <laughs> you're damn sure. So I, did, so I did that, I said yes. And I, did, I didn't know where I was going until a week before. So um, I packed all my stuff, we went to Iceland and I'm thinking it's a Lou Berlin project, which it was, until we get to the airport. And she's like, by the way, Annie Leibovitz is, is part of the collaboration or whatever. It was like three days before or something like that. I don't remember the timeline, but it was very, I had no idea. I was like, Annie Leibovitz. And we had worked with her one other time um, with a Lou Berlin project, but I didn't know that we were going to be like chilling with her in Iceland, you know? So it was a secret because they didn't want the Iceland news to report that she was coming because it was, they didn't want everyone to know about the project until it was done. So we get to Iceland and 
we hike a glacier, we go out in the, on the water and he's like standing in these crazy places and there's a storm that's happening and it was crazy. But basically, you know, Annie Leibowitz sets up her shot and then we have like 10 minutes to get a full body painted to match the background. And he jumps in there and we take the picture. And so it was, it was uh, one of the coolest things I've ever done. Bjork was a really cool thing too. That Bjork was like one of the coolest things too. So, but. Those are both great stories. Thank you for sharing them. That's really amazing stuff. Stay um, muted and watch this. You're so bossy. <laughs> um, thank you for your time. You've been very generous. We went over by about a half hour. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. Thank you for staying on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm now what I'm worried about is that the uh, painting's no longer there waiting for me. So I'm going to have to hang up in a minute and go see if it's still there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you're safe. I'm glad that everybody that around you is safe and healthy. And um, yeah, I mean, it might, it might do great things for the value of my collection if you were to get COVID, but you know, I'm, <laughs> I'll put myself second for once. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and inviting me and always supporting me over the years and um i miss you and when covid's over i want to come visit yes please i'll look forward to you uh painting some landscapes out here i live uh, not too far for some from some things that i think you'll find uh pretty inspirational so i'll see you soon thank you everybody all right take care great questions bye bye, -bye.